Good morning. This morning I'm going to talk about the statutes and law of this country. I will make my declaration first so you can understand where I'm coming from. I could moralise about making groups of the population above the law when nobody's above the law. I could make comment that if you're driving at 31 mile an hour and a 30 mile an hour limit you are technically breaking the law. And in this particular case if somebody's made a declaration that they've done a journey which is 60 miles long in one hour and that journey passes through th three 30 mile an hour speed limits then the conclusion must be that at some stage during that journey they must have broken the law because it's technically impossible even at 70 mile an hour in some section drive through a 30 mile an hour section and maintain an average of 60 mile an hour. So if you have a conversation with somebody over the phone there's times when you can tell they've broken the law, there's times when you can't tell whether they've broken the law. So, with this in mind, my, my background and my previous occupations, I wrote the database for the caravan industry. 115 standards and statutes broken down into 3,000 questions, which meant that when you looked at the final questionnaire, which are for the four classifications, it meant that you, as an individual, with no legal training, no technical training, could identify whether the caravan was meeting the requirements of the standards and statutes of the Road Vehicle Construction and Use Act, electricity, etc. What I have done now is done exactly the same on the laws that apply to a bailiff. Those laws which he is not allowed to break because he is not, a, he is not above the law. When the police are phoned and they are told there is a thug on your doorstep who refuses to ID, refuses to show court paperwork, makes claim that his paperwork allows him permission to enter your property and refuses to leave for 80 minutes, then runs away before the police arrive and then when you make a formal complaint to the courts, you have 12 people turn up outside your house, six cars and three vans and those six cars are identical to the cars that the company have in their aerial photograph I think it is reasonable to believe that crimes are being committed. So this video is going to be a little bit longer than all. I'm going to go through all 16 laws that I could find and break down individual things so people can understand there was law breaking, there was criminal intent and for the police to make a claim that no crime was committed simply because he used the words over the telephone he was a bailiff while refusing to give ID is unacceptable. So I say to Surrey Police, you pick up people for doing 33 mile an hour and a 30 limit and you prosecute them. You prosecute people for having bald tyres, yet you do nothing, nothing to stop known thugs who have previously criminalised people from doing it again. It is unacceptable. Right, first statute. Taking control of Goods Act Regulations 2013. Minimum period of notice. 6. Subject to paragraph 3, notice of enforcement must be given to the debtor not less than 7 clear days before the enforcement agent takes control of the debtor's goods. Section 7 which applies in this case because he claimed the seven day letter had been sent. Notice of enforcement must be given in writing. Must contain the following information, the name and address of debtor. And if the name is on the letter, then the postal act comes into fa fashion. The reference number of all numbers and the date of notice. So this is sent in a sealed envelope to the name and address of the debtor. The only legal address of this particular debtor was not my address. So therefore we have to ask whether the letter was sent to my address in the first place. Now we go back to the letter. Both Mr and Mrs X denied ever seeing this notice of enforcement. There are two reasons why I find this was never sent. The first I've alluded to, this means the demonstration of sending of the notice of enforcement lay within DCBL's power. It was indeed absolutely incumbent on them to prove this matter, but they failed to do so. 
I would add that their numerous failings to the observance of proper and lawful procedures, which I will present, presently come to, do not inspire me with confidence the notice of enforcement was se sent. Secondly, the exes scrupulously produced every document they received from DCBL and their solicitor. Mr. Jones visited their business premises in order to satisfy himself that he had been given everything relevant. If I can say without impertinence or disrespect, the exes struck me as a sophist unsophisticated, artless people who would neither have suppressed the document nor seen any advantage in doing so. Given Mr. X's somewhat unwise and unreasonable stance in relation to the judgment debt, it is perfectly possible that if the notice had arrived, he would have ignored it. But that dem does not demonstrate that it did arrive. On the balance of probabilities, I find that it did not rise arrive because it was never sent. Understand Surrey Police? Do you understand DCBL? You have been found wanting. In section 44 it states it remains to deal with what I have called DCBL's overarching defence. This is clearest expression in paragraph 29 of the witness statement of Miss Mia that's the legal legal director of DCBL, in that she, as follows, are commanded by the High Court to enforce the High Court writ. As such, all conduct by DCBL was carried out lawfully. Now, the important thing about this is, is paragraph 46 of this court hearing. These paragraphs, particularly the first, demonstrate a lamentable misunderstanding of the true legal position. Paragraph 19 of the National Standards of Enforcement Agents, published by the Ministry of, Def of Justice on the 6th of April 2014, states, Enforcement agents must act within the law at all times, including all legislation. Please note, sorry police. Enforcement agents must act within the law at all times, including legislation. A writ of control is not to be regarded as a blank check or a license to act with impunity. Please note, Craig Fishwood. However, it is astonishing concern their clients, a body and an individual under statutory license should have done so. Take together with multiple breaches of procedure and absence of proper records, the lack of recognition or insight on the part of, on the part of the persons concerned, the lack of days or dismissive attitude of DCBL to these proceedings, and the fact that what oversight the third defendant exercised with respect to DCBL was and is apparently rendered from Florida, there are grounds to consider terminating the third defendant authorization to act as an enforcement officer under regulation 12 of the high court Reg enforcement officers regulation 2004 i will refer the case to the senior master for consideration she may wish to consider the most mrs short star and wesson they are the dcpl agents now that is damning on dcpl we now move on to is it criminal is it civil well, for my ease of interpretation, and I'm not a lawyer or barrister, I would say if it's an arrestable offence, it's criminal. If it's a non-arrestable offence, it's civil. Now, we've already established that Craig Fisherick arrived at my property without warrant, without ID, without the seven-day letters of being sent. So the moment he left home, with the documents he claimed to have his permission to enter my property. He was going equipped. DCBL at that point in time were aiding and abetting. When he arrived at my property, he parked his vehicle facing the wrong direction across my gate for 80 minutes. That's Road Traffic Act, Section 137, and if it had been at night, he would have been facing the wrong direction with no lights on outside a 30 mile an hour speed limit. But we'll put that to one side. So, intimidation by blocking my drive, which is a criminal offence. And section 68, aggravated trespass, 
He was told to leave. He had no identification. He prevented me from using my property. Right. We now turn to Schedule 12, Paragraph 2, Subsection 3. A certified agent, if he's not the person on whom an enforcement power is conferred, may act on, under the power only if authorised by that person. So if a certified enforcement officer is to act within the legal framework of section, of section 12, to enable him to make a claim he's a High Court enforcement officer, he must carry various pieces of paper to remain within the law. These are his certified enforcement, enforcement agent ID card with photograph, a company ID, and a third document which states he is authorised to work at the High Court level signed by the High Court enforcement officer within that company. If he does not have the document, he's committing misfeasance or in non-legal terms, he's an imposter. If he has no legal authority to enforce a High Court risk unless the High Court enforcement officer is on site, on, on, is on site or written proof he has authority person to person. The schedule says person, not person to company. By wording it, by the wording, it is not a blanket authority given to a whole company of 50 plus people. So on arrival at the victim's house, to change from thug to legal constituted High Court Enforcement Officer, he must never break the law in any respect. He must carry his court ID. He must carry his company ID and paperwork with his company name. He must carry a certified copy of the High Court Enfor Enforcement Officer's permission. He has the legal right to act to enforce a High Court writ if the HEO is not, is not present. He must have legal documents showing the correct name and address of the victim. He must withdraw if a per vulnerable person is present. He must show the occupier of the property all of the above. He cannot take possession if the address he has is the correspondence address. As this thug, Craig Fishwick, refused to show his ID, refused to show the court order, refused to display he was le a legally enforcement officer. Sorry, Craig, you were an illegal thug because you refused to show your ID, you broke the law. When you parked across my drive, you broke the law. When you stayed on my premises for 80 minutes, you broke the law. You are just a legalised thug. Do you understand, Craig Fishwick? Legalised thug. You don't deserve to have any permissions to enter anyone's property.